and we are recording now. Okay, Lena, whenever you're ready. Okay. So thank you for joining us today, Reverend Susan, and the rest of the OC members that are here. Um, I just want to open us up with a quote and then also a little context about why we're having this conversation. Um, part of why we're having this conversation is that as our elder, as part of the 360 Council, we really honor and love and respect you and your work and where we feel like that is being tarnished in any way, we want to give you the opportunity to um, speak your truth and to have a voice to um, stand up for yourself in your own words from your own perspective. Um, so that's a, a little bit of, um, I think, why we're here today, why it's important for us to come together and do this. Um, and I'd like to offer up a quote from Bell Hooks from her book, um, All About Love, New Visions. And it's from page 49. And it says, when men, when men and women punish each other for truth telling, we reinforce the notion that lies are better. To be loving, we willingly hear each other's truth. And most important, we affirm the value of truth telling. Lies may make people feel better, but they do not help them to know love. And I just think that's a really beautiful grounding for us. So, Nashe. You know, yes, Nashe. thank you. Nashe. So with that, I just want to um, invite you, Reverend Susan, to just offer any reflections, any Anything that you want to share that's happened over sort of a timeline of events um, and give us an idea of what's going on for you. Okay. Um, excuse me. Um, oh, God. If you remember the last time we had a, uh, a session, Zoom session, when we just talked about blue things, and I advise as I am asked, was July 25th. And I share with you that I had, was involved in some very disturbing situations that started that week. Every year when the senior minister, Rob Hardis, is on vacation, June, July, and August, I'm acting senior minister. And when he's on sabbatical for eight months, as he was in 2016, I'm acting senior minister for seven years I've done this. But this summer, for the first time, when I came back from GA in June, I preached a sermon July 2nd on being black and blue. And I used the excerpts from Frederick Douglass's speech given that weekend in 1852, which didn't have a title, but has become known as what to the American Negro slave is your 4th of July. And I said the speech is 2,500 words and I'm not gonna read all of them, but I use an excerpt and I said, sit in your pews this morning and think about this administration in the White House and the marginalization of our people in our country and listen to some of what our Unitarian African-American brother, Frederick Douglass said. And then the next 20 minutes I talked about blue and what you all are doing nationally, what we're doing nationally, the fact that Paula Cole Jones and I were honored at the GA and about the book Century navigating race authenticity and power uh, about where 20 of us religious educators of religious professionals of color have shared our story about what happens when in a predominantly white church setting the person in authority is a person of color and um not knowing that everybody did not buy into Rob Hardy's multicultural, multiracial goal seven years ago. And I began to experience the microaggressions of racism and sexism. And it all boiled down when within 24 hours, an officer of the, a member of the church resigned from their position when I sent an email that any functioning executive and pastor would send, but I sent it while being black and female and in authority. And that was the straw that broke his white male privilege and white male fragility back. And he resigned with 36 page documents saying, this is the reason why I'm resigning. And he has hated the fact that I have been called as the minister all these years and that the vote that called me 
was 251 to 14. And he was proud to be one of the 14 that said no. And so he accused me of plagiarizing Frederick Douglass's speech, which is fair use in public domain. And it's just ridiculous, it just got ridiculous. And so I received emails that were threatening and hostile in tone. And within 48 hours, he resigned from the church and said he was gonna send these same things out to anyone. But at that point, the board of the church, I asked, I told them I don't feel safe. I feel threatened, could we have a conference call? And I heard from no one. And the next day, one of the women on the board texted me and said, Reverend Susan, I'm sorry you're going through this, but I'm gonna give you a heads up. The chair of the board has instructed us to back away from you because this is no longer a fiduciary matter for the board, but a conflict between a congregant and a minister. And so here I was in the midst of 1,100 beloved community people, the only full-time minister, the only executive team minister at the church, and I had no one. I was abandoned. And so, in long story short, the attorney said, you all, the chair should write a letter to the congregation saying some of you may have received a letter from a former member questioning the integrity of our minister, blah, blah, blah. We, the board and officers, assure you that we back and support Reverend Susan, blah, blah, blah. Well, I told the board chair, and within an hour, he called me back, and some of the board members, and they were all white, said, well, we don't think you should send that because if people didn't get his letter, they would think something, and get ours, they'll think something's wrong at all souls. Something is wrong. And so it went on and on and on. And so finally, Reverend Hardys did email me and the board chair and said, do you think I should fly back from California and talk to you all um, and then go back? And the chair said, no, definitely not, because people would think something's wrong. And I said, definitely yes. Because as a pastor, look at this. An officer elected by the congregation within 24, 48 hours receiving an email from me has resigned. And next Sunday, when you come back, I'm going to be gone. And it's questions of faith. And anybody can stand up and say, is it true that Reverend Susan has been asked to resign? And that you've been asked to apologize to the church for ever allowing her to come here? And the last thing I said to him was, Rob, First Corinthians says that when there is an uncertain sound of the trumpet, the people are not prepared for battle. And if you never come again, it should be now as CEO and pastor to give the board instructions. He flew in, we met at a board member's house, and he told them that I was overseeing a confidential uh, sexual harassment complaint from where 18 women had contacted me within three days that one member of the church that have been victimizing them and stalking them, different ones for six years, five years, two years. And they finally got the courage to tell me who that person was. And so I, along with the Committee on Right Relations, was addressing it, overseeing an ad hoc committee of the church to write a policy on how to address congregant behavior when there is a dangerous, disruptive person in the congregation because we have nothing in our bylaws to address this. And then, um, when Rob came back from vacation in August, I said to him, you can make this a part of our church's ministry or disruption of it. I said, when you stand before the church on questions of faith Sunday, before you take any of the questions from the congregation, you should make a statement that some of you are questioning what Reverend Susan's sermon, August 13th, it's a new day, was about. You were confused. And to say that because of all the social justice things that have happened, marriage equality signed into law by the mayor in our congregation. Uh, we have a Black Lives Matter sign out on 16th Street on the fence, blah, 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 blah. But we, like our denomination, have some white supremacy. And microaggressions of racism and sexism as Reverend Susan has been experiencing, and that's what you heard. But he could say something like, but we are more committed than ever to the beloved community in doing anti-white supremacy work, blah, blah, blah. He agreed to that. But I found out the next Sunday he did not do that. And so our president, the newly elected Reverend Frederick, Susan Frederick Gray, was going to preach our homecoming on September 10th. And we never have more than two ministers in the pulpit. And I saw that Rob had um, me on there to do the call to worship and for her uh, to preach and for him to do the announcements. And I called him, I said, Rob, you have a mistake here. You have me on here. And he said, oh no, I want you to do the pastoral prayer and the call to worship. I said, Rob, I am not gonna be pulpit dressing 
for you because there are going to be videographers and photographers in the National UUA here. So it would show up that you have a black woman in the pulpit. And then he said, oh, no, 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 no. Um, um, it's, I, I think all the ministers should be involved. I said, well, then get Reverend Rob Keithen or Reverend Rebecca Parker. There are two white ministers that are uh, contracted with us. And he said, no, I just think since we're the called ministers, we should be us. And then I just said, Rob, with all the hell that I have been going through at this church, and especially this summer, you don't want me in the pulpit because I cannot show, hide the pain on my face. And so he finally said, well, well, why are you this way? And so I said, if you really want to go down that rabbit hole, I just said to him, Rob, I need you to meet with me so I can share with you some disturbing things I discovered this summer as acting senior minister. And so he agreed to meet with me. And so I agreed to be in the pulpit to do the pastoral prayer. But then three weeks passed and he never met with me. I said, I want to meet with you before the board goes into closed session, September 27th, and I share it with the board. And so around September 20th, I said to him, Rob, you haven't given me a date yet. And he said, oh, 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 I forgot. Um, listen, those dates aren't good for my people. I was like, your people? I said, Rob, I asked to meet with you, pastor to pastor. And he said, well, I just thought it would be good to have my coach to facilitate the conversation and to get Reverend so-and-so, who's a good officer to sit in. I said, Rob, you don't need a good officer. My issue is not with you. It's with another member of the staff. And then he said, they're not available till next month. And at that point, I said, I need to be a priority in this church at some point. I've taken care of 1,100 people for seven years. And all I asked was for one meeting. And so I was like in tears when I left the room. And I went across the hall. And one of our other ministers saw me and invited me to come in. And I was just crying. And he was consoling me. But I found out he betrayed me and lied and said that I broke a confidentiality and that Rob should not trust me later. And long story short, September 27th in the board meeting and closed executive session, Rob heard with the board what I had to say to him and tried to say to him a month prior. It was no surprise he knew about it. I talked about the fact that the executive team has been dysfunctional for at least four years that I have been involved and Rob has known about it and has never resolved it. One of the members of the executive team has been disrespectful to me. And it's almost like a cute sibling rivalry. We get along fine. Good friends. I gave her her bridal shower. We've had dinner with our spouses. But when Rob is gone every summer for three months, and when he's gone on sabbatical, it's like she becomes this other person and she is disrespectful. Other officers have talked to Rob about addressing it, and it's never happened. But I talked about the fact I discovered this summer that my contract says I'm to have six weeks of, of leave. I'm supposed to have eight weeks of leave, four study leave, four vacation. But when I got back from sabbatical, that was the first time I was gone, and I looked and saw I just got back in May, and I've been gone since October, but my pay stub said I had a negative 75 hours of leave. How can that be? when I haven't even been here to use it. And the bookkeeper who's black, a Christian woman, not a member of our church, a contractor who's with us one day a week, I went to ask her and she said, well, Reverend Susan, you only have six weeks of leave a year. I said, no, I have eight. She said, well, that's what Katie has told me this whole time that you only had six. And then I found out, I, just, I talked to the board about that. 2014, November, 2014. I realized that my housing allowance had been taxed all year. And so at the end of 2014, the church owed me $10,000. And there has been a pattern of these kind of financial things. And Katie, the executive director of the church, a part of the ET, is the only person who gives our bookkeeper instructions about finances. And I also shared that since I've been at the church, I've gotten sexually violent text messages from someone who says they want to hog tie me and rape me in the pulpit, describing the chair I sit in. And every time I've gotten them, I've shown them to Rob and Katie, the other two members of the ET, and nothing's been done. Um, I've gone to the police to report it, and apparently the person sends it from a computer software, so you can't trace it like a phone number. The police says, well, Reverend, who at the church would hate you so much to send this? And I said, it's 1,100 people sitting out there. I don't know. And he said, all you can do is 
to change your number. And I said, my mother who's 85 can only remember my phone number. So I won't change it. So that night when I finished sharing with the board, I understand they asked Rob to leave the room. They were very disturbed that he never reported to the board about these sexually violent things and that he knew about these problems I've had with the executive team and never resolved them. And so the next day, I had an appointment to meet with the interim conference minister of the United Church of Christ, the denomination wherein I have been ordained for 43 years and hold my standing. Excuse me one moment. And I thought she was new, she's an African-American woman. I thought that she wanted to meet me because I was the seventh black woman ordained in the United Church of Christ denomination since it started in the 1600s. And I went to her hotel room and I was ambushed. There she was in the chair of our church and ministry committee, Reverend Audrey Price, and they told me they had received a letter from one of the officers of our church who accused me of violating the ministerial code of ethics and conduct. And I was now under formal fitness review. And I was in shock because I had my guard down. I wasn't prepared for this. And I had just gone through this meeting the night before. And she started walking back and forth like a general uh, patent. I don't even know her. And she was saying, you need to take boundary training. I said, I taught boundary training. She was telling me all this stuff. I said, I used to be on the response, clergy response team. If anything happened, I was one of the investigators. And she would not even let me share with her that prior to the UCC getting this letter from a member of our church in September, that this is the same officer who resigned in July and uh, began sending out the same letter to members of our church, sent it to the UUA National Church, sent it to the UU Ministers Association Director, sent it to Rosemary Bray McNatt, the president of Star King School of Ministry where I serve on the board, and they would call Rob and Rob would tell him that it's baseless and that he had a problem and whatever, whatever. And, uh, but then when he sent it to the UCC, unfortunately, we had an interim conference minister who I said is not racism because she's black, is not sexism because she's a woman, but she is someone who was abusing her privilege and power. And I found out that she has done something against every African-American UCC minister in the Washington, D.C. area. And I started asking for prayer because there's this confidentiality statement, which only says that you cannot identify the PRQ, which is the person who raised questions. You cannot try to seek to contact them or share details with anybody who has signed, who, who don't know before October 4th. And so by me calling clergy asking for prayer, I found we found out that she has been an abusive way with all black clergy. And that's another situation. And so Reverend Hardy's used this UCC situation as a pretext, isolating me from the church and to use it to terminate my employment because I had exposed uh, the mismanagement of the past four years that he's responsible for. And, um, the next day, I was just, just so distraught by everything my therapist said to me. She wanted me on 30 days medical leave of absence because I'm working in a toxic environment at the church with the ET. She wrote the letter, and I was supposed to be returning to work October 31st. Then my mother died, and then Rob had the board grant me personal leave till the end of the year. And he has used the UCC as an excuse why I was away because I was ready to come back to church the 1st of January. But um, because as a, as a minister on review, you're not on trial, you're on review. So unless the charges are sexual misconduct or abuse of finances, which they announced, the UCC minister announced to my congregation that mine are not, that you are expected to work every day. But Rob has been the only voice the board and the church has heard. But our people are trained to be advocates in the Unitarian Church. And after a while, everybody was like, something's wrong with this. And they started petitions, bring Reverend Susan back in January. And so all of a sudden, Rob sent a letter out to me on December 21st, as I was about to go to Jamaica to take my mother's ashes, that said, the board has extended my leave till January 31st, and that 
there are, he has issues with my job of performance and behavior, and that I'm not in right relations with members of the board, the executive team, and the staff. And I was devastated and confused. I was crying, and my husband called the board chair. And the board chair, he read the letter, and the board chair said, that is not what the board said. That's Rob Hardy's letter. He said, the board just said, voted to give you leave till the end of January that we're going to contact the UCC and say, we've cooperated with you. You said this would be over by the end of the holidays, and we want Reverend Susan to come back. But Robin Hardy's is the one who said that. And so the thing is this. How... In seven years, I only had one evaluation that was September 2014 that Reverend Hardy's gave me excellent. So he went back to say at a congregational meeting, a town hall last Wednesday, that he had issues with me and my behavior and job performance since 2013. If that be the case, why did I get an excellent review in 2014? And he said that the staff feel bullied by me and are afraid to be at the church unless he's there. If that be the case, why would he go on sabbatical from January to August of 2016 and leave me in charge of the church? Alone, I was the, I mean, why? And then in 2017, when I returned from sabbatical, I told him that I had decided I wanted to retire from All Souls Church in seven years because he knew that I was very tired of the difficulties I'd gone through that had been unresolved and unaddressed. And he was afraid and others that I would not come back. And so I met with him and I said, after the white supremacy had been discovered in the denomination and with Reverend Peter Morales resigning and with my relationship with Blue and how the new administration is publicly supporting it, I want to come back and I said, I, you have the trustee board as your, your driver's side mirror, the congregation and the staff is your passenger side mirror, and your colleagues and ministry, your rear view mirror. I, as a woman of color and a minister of 40, over 40 years of pastoral ministry, I am your, blue, your blind spot. I want to come back and be your blind spot and hold your arms up. And he was happy that I was gonna come back. That would be the time if you had issues with me to say, you know, well, no, I don't think you should come back. I'm having issues, blah, blah, blah. And one thing that's interesting is January 2017, while I was still on sabbatical, I got a letter from Rob. Congratulations, you've gotten a raise of $9,200. Why do you give a raise of $9,200 to somebody that you have job performance issues with and the staff is afraid of, et cetera? And I know it's only the executive team that gives raises. It has to be approved by the board, but it's only the executive team. And so I called a member of the board, an African-American woman, and I said, how did this happen? And she said, oh, we didn't know it was you, but you left in October for sabbatical, and we gave the executive team the compensation guidelines from the UUA for 2017. And said, make sure all of our employees, all 23, full and part-time, are being compensated accordingly. And you can look on it and see that for every year it shows for what position the minimum, the mid, and the max sales should be. And so they said, they came back and said it was only one person. They, didn't, they don't want to know who it is, but get, make it right. So I talked to Jan Gartner, the director of the UUA Office of Compensation, and she sent me the guidelines from 2012 to 2017, and I looked at it. And what my so-called raise in 2017 did is brought my salary to what it should have been at the minimum for the past four years. Previous four years, I mean. And I found out over the summer, again, that my leave had been incorrect and that my budget, I never received a full budget, that Katie has never given me a full budget. The personnel section has been missing. So I was trying to pay some um, items and she said, you should go from this budget line. And I said, Valerie, I can't find it. And I handed her my budget. And she looked through it puzzledly and said, Reverend Susan, there's the personnel section is missing from your budget. And I looked and I had never gotten a full one because if I had seen the salary of the other executive team members, I would have known that something was wrong. And so at this point, there have been other members, women, religious professionals and people of color on our staff who in the past seven to 10 years have gone silently into that dark, dark night 
And when they've left, we've been told that you can't talk about it because it's personnel. Rob will put a nice little spin on it. The difference this time is they were hires. I was not hired by Rob. I was not hired by the board. I was called by a vote of 251 to 14 by the congregation. And the members of the church started being very sagacious and intelligent people want answers. And so Rob started calling everything confidential, 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 which is not confidential. And we eventually had a mediation with Reverend Hope Johnson, who we both know and love and knew she's fair. And she came and mediated with our two good officers looking. And I sat there for three hours with Rob just lying. And I, I just stopped at one point and said, Rob, I'm, I said, I don't want to, you to call me an insubordinate. So, but I just want to state that everything you're saying is not true. Because of all of these were problems you've had since 2013. No one has given me a note, a letter. I've never had a meeting. I've never had an evaluation. And I'm hearing it for the first time. But it's not true. And at the end of the day, we agreed that in the best interest of the congregation, that we would separate. Rob and I separating as the called clergy of the church, not me leaving the church. Hope was clear that this is not a resignation. And she said, Rob is supposed to announce to the uh, congregation that my separation has nothing to do with the UCC, because that's what he's been sending out in public emails. But then the next day, that was January 17th. We agreed that too, that I could preach and that the church could have a celebration to show their love for me before I leave. The next morning at nine o'clock, I met from nine to 12 with the response team investigators from the United Church of Christ. They, have been, they had interviewed 14 people before me, people that Rob had told them at the church to interview. And I walked into this room, here's two white people I don't know, and I'm the last one, the minister in question, the MIQ, you're the last one to investigate and interview. And for two and a half hours, they asked me questions that didn't have anything to do with the original allegations from the PRQ. But these were all questions related to what Reverend Hardy's had said verbatim to me the day before. And so they had already interviewed him. And I'm sitting there shocked that he has introduced he has used another denomination's process to introduce All Souls Personnel Matters, which is a violation of our policy manual, and personnel policy manual, and a violation of my privacy, because what he shared with them had nothing to do with what the original PRQ's charges were. And here are these white people who, you can see the white privilege, they believe him, you know, he's the senior minister of 18 years of this church, and they believe him and whatever. And um, it was just, it was just awful. And then um, that night, I called a trusted UU clergy person of color, and she told me that Rob violated the UU minister's code of ethics and covenant by doing that. And um, she said, I should write the board a letter about it, and I did. I wrote the board a letter that this was a gross violation of privacy, blah, blah, blah. And not realizing the board didn't get it because right after our January 17th meeting where I verbally agreed to separate, um, I had been uh, cut off from the church email server, not knowing it, so the board didn't get my letter. Um, I, we have in our phone an uh, app called Church Life, where as Minister of Pastoral Care, I can look up any member and get their picture, their birth date, information. I put in pastoral comments when I visit them, so whoever comes after me will have it. I went to look up a couple's address to send them a card for their 62nd anniversary, and I saw that I had been blocked. I'm, I'm not a criminal. I have not committed a crime. I'm not on sub suspension or or probation, and all of a sudden, I'm off the website. You can't find my picture. You can't find my bio on the website. And then the letter goes out. I get the letter that's drafted from Rob and the attorneys to go to the congregation announcing my departure. 
And when I get it, it sounds like it says that I've resigned, all through it, resign, resign, resign. And hope was clear that it's a separation, not a resignation. And it sounds so legalistic, and it says that I am resigning from All Souls Church, blah, 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 blah. And so I edited that. I was sitting there and I edited it to say, we are writing to inform you that the Reverend Dr. Robert Hardys and Reverend Dr. Susan Newman have agreed upon a separ separa separation of the best interests and well-being of the church. And then it goes down and says something about, this is a, fr a wonderful opportunity for Reverend Susan to have a fresh start. I don't need a fresh start. I've been in ordained ministry for over 40 years. I don't need a fresh start. I deleted that and I put in, Iyana Von Zahn has said in her book, Acts of Faith, that people come into your life for a season, a reason, and a lifetime. And so this is a season of transition at All Souls Church. And as we celebrate Reverend Susan's gifts with that, blah, 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 and went down like that. So anyway, that letter went out Monday. And when that letter went out, the church was up in arms. I mean, it started going up around the country. And so they called, Rob called a, book, a town hall meeting that Wednesday night. The letter went out on Monday. You're supposed to give people uh, two weeks' notice before a church meeting happens. They got the letter Monday, and Wednesday night was a town hall meeting. Tuesday, I got a letter from the church attorney uh, with a settlement offer and also saying that they want the assurance that my husband nor I will be on the church premises uh, the night, Wednesday night, of the town hall meeting. Well, I didn't have a representative there. I was not there. And the board and Rob had already scripted what was going to be said. And with, with certain questions come up, who will answer it? And Rob stood up there, I understand, and just said how my behavior has been terrible and blah, 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 blah. But what happened, from what I understand from some members, is that for the first time, members saw and they knew that this was a lie. And they were like, well, where's Reverend Susan? Can she answer? So people ask questions. But what happened is there were members of the staff that when I went to clean my office out last Saturday, one of the members of the staff who met me there, Rob had said that he felt threatened by my husband. And I said to him when he opened the door, I said, I'm sorry if something was ever said by me that made you feel bullied or scared of me or threatened by my husband. And he had tears in his eyes and then he said, I didn't say that. And I said, this is what Rob said. And he said, that's not what happened. And so while I was packing my office, I said, tell me what happened because he and I were close. I said, well, what happened? And he said, you had gotten us retreat facilitated that was going to focus on relationships and diversity for our staff retreat this fall because that's what staff wanted. They didn't want to do strategic planning. And he said, so after you were gone, I think it was like in the 1st of December or the end of November, Rob asked the staff to get their calendars out so we can plan the retreat. And they didn't have a date in that. He and another member of the staff went to Rob and said, the staff doesn't want to have a retreat on relationships and diversity until the ET has one, because the ET is dysfunctional. So here in September, I told the board, the ET is dysfunctional. And now the staff is saying to Rob in December, the ET is dysfunctional. So all of his alarms are going off. It's like Toto pulling the curtain back from the Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And so when January came, it was just swift movements to get me uh, away. And Sunday night, I met with the UCC. And they showed me the testimony of four trustees, three of whom have been staunch, staunch supporters of Rob and heads of his committee on ministry. And they lied. It was just parrot, that their words were just parroting what Rob has said. There were a couple of people who uh, were supportive. And then there were four staff members that he chose. And it just was ridiculous. And so I had to sign that I read them. And I just said, this is not true. I've never violated confidentiality. I've never bullied anybody. There is no proof of support of this, blah, blah, blah. So basically, now what will happen this week, the UCC uh, Committee on uh, Church and Ministry is going to meet. 
they would hear the um, information, they would deliberate, they would make a decision, and I would either be stripped of my ordination credentials of uh, 43 years, um, and even when, when you've been stripped by the ordinate, ordaining denomination that you have standing, even if another denomination wants me to work, I'm not ordained, you see. Um, and, or I could be censored, and uh, censored, and um, I have to take some kind of classes, boundary training, or something like that. And this is the thing that was interesting at the very end, what they said. They had the UCC Minister's Code of Ethics and Conduct, our covenant. And in it, it was saying that, um, she said that, uh, Robert said, I have cliques of people who I have relationships with. So if some people get all of my attention, but there are other members who I'm not as close to. Well, how close can you be to 1,100 people at one time? But, you know, it's that kind of thing. So I was just at that point, and I feel like this. There comes a time when you must break the law, go against the policy or the practice of the culture when it's oppressive, when it's evil, when it is wrong. And there comes a time when you cannot be silent. And so if me telling the truth about the dysfunction and the mismanagement that I've observed in our executive team is what has rained this down and the fact that one young white member of our, male of our church, when I said something about checks not being signed, which was an area of fiduciary responsibility that he's in, which was the straw that broke his white male fragility back, and he reveals that he is hated for all this time, then so be it. I feel like what Rosa Parks, it's like, this is not about me. I feel like I'm the catalyst. I'm the yeast in the midst of this. For well, here is the flagship church of the denomination that has white supremacy in it, and et cetera, et cetera. And the thing that happened last night, I was so hurt and wounded by all this, and I could not understand. I thought it was because my mother died, and I had to do her memorial service in the midst of all of this. Because for seven years, I took care of all those members by day. And at night, I took care of my mother. And now I wake up and I have neither one. That community and that support is gone. But last night, my husband and I were going to the movies around 8 o'clock. And I was brushing my hair in the mirror. And I repressed a memory that is very, that I have but the repressed emotions connected to it came together for the first time. That hearing this confidentiality, you broke confidentiality, it came back to me when I was five years old. My father, father was an alcoholic, abusive. And when I was a child, I was five, and he took me to this woman's house, and there was a little two-year-old boy, and he said, that's your brother, Robert. And then he and this woman went to a room in the back, and now I know they were having sex for two hours. And the night when I got home, and my mother got home from work, and she said, what did you do today? And I said, I met my brother Robert. My father dragged me out the bed at 1 o'clock in the morning, and he punched me in the face with his fist. And he said, that will teach you for telling secrets. And I wore purple and blue bruises in my face at school, and my mother put makeup on it. And in 1960, in 62, there weren't school counselors. And a child who has all of this, seeing this violence in her home every day, I would tell my teachers what happened at home. The daddy threw my mother's clothes and things out in the street and nailed the door to our house shut. And that he beat mom and he beat me. And they would call my mother and said, Susan's airing the family laundry. And I'm told, don't tell anybody. It's a secret. But what really came through was that I had repressed being sexually molested by my history teacher when I was 14. And when I was brushing my hair, I remember my hair came down to my waist and I cut my hair to my shoulders because he liked my long hair. And I remember he told me, don't tell anybody. It's a secret. 
And that is what came back to me. It started coming back to me last night. And I was crying. Because when you tell someone you've been raped, and you run to someone and tell them that you're in pain, and then they say you can't trust her because she can't keep a secret or confidentiality. And then I'm going to be scapegoated because I told the truth. Well, Buddha says there are three things guaranteed to rise, the sun, the moon, and the truth. And last night, my husband called one of the members of the church who has been a supporter and an advocate, and he took me to her house, and I just cried and told her, and she understood, and she said, the women of the church know that there are women who are not helped here. And we would go to a, get a family from Afghanistan for sanctuary and asylum last year, Reverend Keithan. But for me to go to his office, I had no harboring, no sanctuary, no asylum. And so I don't want, I say, if my suffering has opened the eyes to some of the members of the church, so that nobody else will go through this, then it's worth it. And that's why I wanted to share this with you all because I feel this is what Blue is empowered to do, not just for Black Lives you, you, but when you do it for the Black Lives you, you, those of us who are the lowest and most marginalized in a predominantly white denomination, when you lift us up and are advocates for us, it's advocates for all people who are oppressed. And I, I want the truth out. And I will not sign a non-disclosure. If I have to walk away from all souls with no money, I am not gonna sign a non-disclosure that I'm not gonna tell the truth about my life. And um, I'll just take questions now. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Reverend Susan, for sharing all of that and being so open with us. Um, I wanted to just potentially get some specifics around the two meetings you mentioned, the one in September <clears throat> and then the one in January. Um, for those that don't know, I actually flew to D.C. to be at the um, town hall meeting that Reverend Susan just mentioned at All Souls. Um, the Blue Organizing Collective just felt really strongly about, one, supporting the Black UUs who had contacted us, saying that they were very upset about what was going on, um, and so we were lending some moral support for them and also to bear witness to what um, was happening at All Souls that evening. Um, and so I attended the full meeting and also got to meet with some of the congregants as well. Um, so there was some confusion amongst, uh, based on the communications from the church to the congregation around the purpose of those two meetings and, um, and kind of what the outcome was supposed to be from each of them. So it would be helpful to know from your perspective who called each of those meetings and, and what was the purpose of them so people are, have a good understanding. The September 27th one? Correct. The September 27th one is a normal um, every fourth Wednesday board of trustees meeting. Um, but ahead of time, ahead of the meetings, the executive team, which is Katie Lowry, Reverend Hardy's and myself, Katie's executive director, who's over like COO finances, and the chair and two vice chairs of the board, who are the executive committee of the board, we all meet a week before the board meeting and we set the agenda. And so at our ET board prep meeting, I requested to be, uh, to have closed executive session to share a personnel matter with the board. And the thing is this, earlier in the month, I met with Reverend Rebecca Parker, who is a contracted minister with us, former president of Star King, Reverend Hardy's, and I, and I was telling them about how hurt I was by being the only minister full-time and the only executive team person for three months at the church, and how when the board abandoned me for, three, for one month, when they were instructed to back away, and Rebecca and Rob said that I should share my hurt and pain with the board, and so Rob approved the closed executive session, but between the beginning of September and the meeting on the 27th, 
Leslie, I heard your words that you had said once before last year when I was talking about the beginning of Troubles. And I want to share my feelings. And you said, they're not, you and Takiya said, they're not worthy of your feelings and pain. And I thought about it. That when I asked for a close executive a conference call and they said it's not their matter, so I decided to bring a fiduciary issue. So that was a normal board meeting. But then the uh, September 7th, Rob sent a letter to the board saying about this vendetta that the PRQ had against me because the fact that he was sending stuff out all over and that as they deliberate that he would hope that they would remember that this is a vendetta he has against me and he was so supportive of me. But then when I uh, shared about the dysfunction of the ET, Rob switched. And um, my meeting that I asked, I requested to meet with him one-on-one -on -one, and he brought in his coach. And he brought in his good officer. So I invited my good officer, I invited her just as an observer. But from then on, every email that Rob wrote, he would say, out in our good offices meeting. And I kept saying, it's not a good offices meeting. It was a meeting I requested. And so notes that my good officer sent me, I shared it with two members of the board because she made very cogent statements about dysfunction of, and did, we, did Rob consider patriarchy and white supremacy? and my, how I've been treated as a black woman at the church and disrespected over against how he would. And when he, the, he learned that I had shared those notes with someone, he said, she's broken confidentiality. And I said, I did, did, nobody said nothing about confidentiality. This was not, a, so he's turning my meeting into a good officer's intervention. And the board, so from September till now, the only voice the church members have heard is his voice. So he put his spin on it. And so that's how we wound up on January 17th, having a meeting with a mediator from national staff. And um, at the you know, sitting there listening to him say that he doesn't trust me and blah, blah, blah. It was just, you know, obvious. It's like, okay, I don't want to hurt the well-being in this church and I don't want to go through hell anymore. I'm six, I'm all six, I'll be 61 in a few months, and I've been in ministry since I was 15. And I was trying to bring my years of ministerial experience to a church that said it wanted to be multicultural, multiracial, and I was willing to be the canary in the mine. But he's trying to control the message, and that's what happened then. So people were ready for me to come back. Oh, yes. Martin Luther King Sunday, we had the Boca Mosa Youth Choir from South Africa. And so my husband and I, we had not been to the church since September. We came and we were late because I was wrestling with whether to come. But we came and we slipped in there and Rob looked at me from the pulpit and just glared. Didn't say a word and the people were happy to see me. And my husband and I took a selfie up close to us and I put it on the unofficial Facebook page of All Souls and said, I'm ready to come back. And he had me blocked from that page, blocked from all social media, and said that um, he heard that I had prayer with someone in January. A woman was facing radical mastectomy that I had been walking with for three years with her breast cancer. And I called to have prayer with her and her family the night before. He wrote me an email that I was forbidden to provide pastoral care while I was on leave. And I said, it's personal leave. So the folk found out about all of this the same time at the town hall meeting. And they didn't get to hear me, my voice, or anybody representing me. All they heard was Rob and his um, representatives. And so now people are asking questions because they're looking at the past religious professional women and of color and their separation. And one, one former black gentleman who was on my executive team who was let go of last year, he and his wife approved for a letter to be read at the town hall meeting that she wrote to Rob and the board saying, where was inherent worth and dignity and how you got rid of my husband and treated him like he was a criminal. And that's how I feel having my uh, locks changed 
I mean, not having my um, keys taken and my corporate card, and you can't find a trace of me on the website. You see. Thanks for that clarification, Reverend Susan. Yes. Reverend Susan, thank you so much for, for sharing so much of, of what's happened over these last several months. Um, you have spoken about this in, in some detail as part of the timeline, but I'm wondering if you can <clears throat> just speak a little bit more to the specific issues around communication between the All Souls leadership um, and the All Souls congregation. You know, what were folks... Uh, what were the particular issues around communication? What were they saying to the congregation um, or not saying to the congregation that you felt like needed to be said um, or needed to be shared? Um, I, I think it would be helpful to pull some of that out a little bit, if you could share a little more. Well, the first thing is that, um, mind you, the meeting with the board on the 27th and then the next day being informed that I'm under fitness review. Um, and my therapist, she wrote a letter saying she wanted me on 30 days leave of absence from All Souls Church because I work in a toxic work environment. And so Rob was supposed to send it to the board, but he didn't. So I sent it to the board, but he sent a letter out to the congregation, making it seem like um, I had some female problem or something, you know, and I would be out. And he announced, I didn't know it, but he announced to them that I wanted my privacy so for no one in the congregation to attempt to contact me. Now here I am going through a stressful time. And then two weeks later in October, the 18th, my mother has a stroke and they know Miss Lillian. And I'm wondering why I haven't gotten any cards or calls or anything. And then a member calls me and says, I'm sorry for bothering you because I know you want your privacy, but we just love you and want to know, do you need any meals or anything? And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, Rob had announced from the pulpit that I wanted my privacy for no one to contact me. And I said, that's not true. I said, but I'm not reading my church email because my therapist does not want me to read anything from the ET or anything. So I said, if people want to show me love, they can e email me on my personal email. And so they started sharing that. But then when that happened, the PRQ, who was still very much involved in the church's email and what have you in church life, gave the UCC a letter that, and they called me and said, we're censoring you because you've broken confidentiality. I have proof that you're asking church members to email you so that you can talk to them about details of this case, blah, blah, blah. And I just told her that's not true. But then what happened is that each month, some message had to go out about why I was not back. So the next message that went out to the whole congregation was that I, the, the, the board has granted me personal leave till the end of the year. So November and December that Miss Lil, my mother had died. I'm going through fitness review. So the, fo the focus kept going on fitness review. And then when I was not back, I was not going to be in the pulpit the first Sunday in January. And people had started petitions, bring Reverend Susan back. That Friday before the first Sunday, Rob sent a letter out to the congregation under his signature and the chair of the board's signature, Judge Tim Rhodes. And Rob sent a draft to Judge Rhodes on Tuesday and Judge Rhodes told him he did not want Rob to send that out. And he said, contact me. And Rob didn't contact him until Thursday night and Rob had already had the letter ready to go out Friday. And the judge, he was very, very upset by it. He was almost in tears because Rob put his name on it and sent the letter out because he felt it should not go out. And the letter said that due to uh, Reverend Susan's fitness review being delayed, and we understand it may go through March, that there are issues with her resumption of work and that it is the UCC that is keeping her away. And at that point, that's what people knew. That's all they knew. But then people's uh, Committee on Right Relations, four members of the Committee on Right Relations, three of them all are former trustees. They asked to meet with me because they wanted to plan how the community would receive me back into All Souls when the fitness review was over. And I was just so happy to go to somebody's house and not be alone. 
And that was when they asked me about it. And I said, that's not true. I said, I could be at work every day. I said, my mother's memorial service was November 4th. I could have returned to work November 10th. I said, but uh, Reverend Hardy's is keeping me away. And so folks started researching and finding out the truth. So uh, he's, he, you know, that's how that happened. People started, people are smart. And I understand that um, tonight is a board meeting. And usually the board meeting only has the nine board members and maybe a couple of officers. But I understand that there are over 200 members of the church plan to attend. Any member in good standing can attend a board meeting. You can't say anything. But something else that has happened that I was told last night that I have never heard of happening. Former trustees of the church, at least six that I know of, are writing a letter today to the sitting board of trustees about the concerns of uh, collusive behavior and mistreatment of me and the fact that the congregation, members who live nationally have moved away, have been writing letters of support to me, organizations. To this day, I have no letter of support to show the UCC from the board of trustees saying they support and back me. I have no letter from Reverend Hardy's, but members of the church and national people like Reverend Natalie Fenmore um, and others who I serve with have written me letters of support, but that's where we are right now. Thank you so much for that clarification. I appreciate it. I do want to add though, I was uh, the first letter of settlement option I got, my attorney got last Tuesday from the church attorney, um, said that uh, they were saying that my last day of leave with pay was January 31st. So they wanted to hurry up and want me to sign what they did. But according to the UU uh, Ministers Association, they have standards for termination of a called minister. And the congregation has rights in congregational policy to be involved in that. But they, um, they have not been informed of that, but some of them have researched and they see it. And that they have what that church has offered me is the lowest possible amount that could be offered, which is one month of pay for every year you serve, which, they, which is like seven. But you know, when you are a minister or a day minister, the bachelor's or master's or doctorate, um, and have been in ministry for over 40 years, five years with this portfolio. I'm not going to just walk out here tomorrow and find a comparable job in income, you see. So I'm leaving that up to the congregation, but that's where we are uh, with that. But the church is being very clear that they want me to be able to preach. They want me to be able to celebrate me. And um, they're, this is, again, this is making folk, it's sort of like this is, What's happening to me, it's like, you can do this to a lot of other people, but when you say that Reverend Susan has bullied somebody, and the worst I've ever done is made me laugh at you when you, you know, you say something, that doesn't ring true. And people, it's like, it's pushed this first domino. And so everything else that has happened in the past, leaders and officers of the church are now adding it up and saying, this is some So I'll be gone off the scene, but at least things will be addressed because you cannot stand up for justice um, out in the street and be oppressive inside your home. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Reverend Susan, would you, the, the other thing that I had a question about because this came as a surprise to the congregants I spoke with, which was Rob's mentioning of issues with your relationship with all folks staff over the last seven years that you've been there. Mm -hmm. um, this was a surprise to the congregants who felt as though they certainly had never been informed or, you know, that nothing had been discussed before mentioning any of this. So could you speak a little bit to that, to, to um, if there were any issues between you and staff, what they may have been, and um, if you were ever notified that there were issues by, by leadership at all. Well, our staff has changed so much in just the seven years I've been there. There are at least 12 people who have come and gone. And my relationship with staff has been good. Um, up, I would say 
up until maybe the last two years when we had some staff hired who are young white women who I'm sure are not used to being around a black woman in authority every day. And so uh, it reminded me so much of when I was chaplain at Hood College, which is an all white women's UCC college. And when I was there, they brought 35 black students in for the first time. And so here are white women who have black roommates. And they would come and say, she was violent to me. And I said, what happened? Did she hit you? No, she was verbally violent. Well, what were you doing? Well, she came in the room and I was using her perfume. I said, did she give you permission to use her perfume? No. So you know when black women are talking to you and we're being serious and we're not laughing, you're not hollering, you say, listen, let's, and I would say things like, I know this is the way it's normally done, but for these eight months as acting senior minister, let's try doing it a little different for a month. So let's do it this way. So here I am, a different leader, and they're not used to taking any instructions from anybody but Rob Hardy's. And so it's like, she's bullying us. Or I can say something with uh, uh, confidence that if a white man had said it, oh, he's brilliant, he's very experienced, he's knowledgeable, you know, but for me, I'm a bitch. And there was one um, uh, young white member of the, the church who, employee, and um, on the staff credit card, we're only supposed to charge $2,500 a month on our credit card. And everybody sees the bill every month. But um, every month she had like $5,000 of charges, $9,000 of charges. And one time there was a round trip ticket to Europe. And so I mentioned it to her supervisor and because the bookkeeper mentioned it to me. And the supervisor said, oh, I'll talk to her. It's probably just she's been hacked and blah, blah, blah. But here it is three years later, I get back from sabbatical and it's something similar. And I handed the bill to Rob and he said, what is this? I said, it's the monthly MasterCard bill. He said, oh, I've been here 17 years and I've never looked at that. I said, well, as the senior minister, you need to at least look at it. I said, you know, you need to know about it. And so she had her jaws tight with me and I just went and sat with her and I said, can I hold your hands? I said, darling, you are the best, whatever, whatever her job title is that we've had in seven years. I said, so I don't have anything against you. I said, but I just want you to know that there are people who see things and they'll never say anything to you. And you'll be walked to the door. And she started crying. And she said, you're the first person to mention this to me. So for the past two years, her supervisor never mentioned it to her. You see? And so I'm not, the, there was one, I've, I've only supervised one employee in seven years. And she was someone that, Katie had problems with and didn't want to supervise her. Rob didn't want to supervise her. And I said, I would supervise her. And it was just that sense of when there's an issue. And I said, okay, it's obvious that you have something that, who am I representing for you? I know it's not me. And so, and we resolved that. But when we've had, I have not had any problems with any staff there, you see. But it, I, and, and the other black ET member, the gentleman who's along with us, we both talked about the fact that when Rob is gone, it's like daddy's not here. And they just kind of like, oh, you know, it's like that, that kind of thing of wanting to be Rob's favorite. And so it's, I have not had any problems, but no one has ever written, uh, according to personnel policy, policy, if you feel harassed or any issue, go to your supervisor immediately and report it. If your supervisor is not available, go to a member of the executive team. Report it and that the supervisor is supposed to address it immediately. There's supposed to be an investigation. You sit down and mediate. If you can't meet with that person, you go first directly to the person. And if they won't hear you, then you get witnesses. And then you go on and on. But honey, ain't nobody come to me about nothing. Nothing. I have had one evaluation. And that was September 2014, and it was excellent. There have been no emails, no notes, no meetings, no suspension, no give you an opportunity to get it straight, no nothing. Wow. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification, Reverend Susan. Yeah, thank you for that. That was, that was my question was just, again, to, to highlight that you've never had a poor performance review in all of your years. Not one. Okay. Well, 
I, I, if, we're, if we're, there are no other questions, I, I would love to just reread that quote again from Bell Hooks because it really lands for me. Um, and I'm going to switch up the language a little bit to help us continue to dismantle the gender binary. Um, so the quote is, again, from Bell Hooks, All About Love, page 49. When humans punish each other for truth telling, we reinforce the notion that lies are better. To be loving, we willingly hear each other's truth, and most important, we affirm the value of truth telling. Lies may make people feel better, but they do not help them to know love. So, in that spirit, deep gratitude for you and just immense love to you on this journey. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend Susan. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us today. Bye-bye.